Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining me. How are we all feeling today? Good. Good, good morning, morning, Professor. Pretty good. Glad to hear it. So today uh, is going to be our first day of actual lecture. Um, it's not going to be a whole lot because the way I have the class set up is today we're going to just work on group quiz one. And hopefully you guys saw on the modules, if you don't or haven't checked, uh, go ahead and do that now if you'd like. Otherwise, I'll give you time a little bit later to do that. So no rush. Uh, but we're going to just work on group quiz one, which is just going to be like a little bit of an introduction back into mathematics. I'm going to go over some of the key concepts and make sure that we understand some of the very much basics of the prerequisites and math in general before we jump into this new wave of math called trigonometry. Okay, so any questions before we get going today? Anything that uh, you're not still sure about with the class or anything else? All right, well then I have my chat up. For those of you that would like to chime in that way, um, feel free to turn on your microphones whenever you have a question. Um, even your faces would be awesome to see. Simran, thank you very much for showing yours. Um, as far as this lecture goes, it's gonna be very short, okay? Uh, something that, again, you guys should know, but just wanted to make sure that you guys do before we start in on anything new. All right. So feel free to raise your hand, speak up, um, or chime in on the chat. I have that up in my second monitor, checking both. All right. This is going to be interactive, so I'd appreciate speaking up or in the chat. So here's the first question. Who can tell me, in their opinion, of course, what three of the most important and widely used concepts in all of math is. Think about that for a second. What do you think is something that you've seen over and over and over since elementary school? Widely used, very, very important math concepts. Anything come to mind? Go for it, Anissa. Um, the concept of PEMDAS. Mm, I like that. Excellent, Anissa. That is one. It's not one of the three that, in my opinion, is one of the most widely used, but it is often used. You're right. Very good. Give you a few more seconds to think of anything. Anyone else? Can I guess again? You got another one? Appreciate it, Anissa. Um, Go ahead. Multiplication. Uh, very good. Very good. That is one that we often use. That is absolutely right. Our math facts, something that we should know off the top of our head. What is seven times eight? You shouldn't have to look that up. Excellent. All good answers. Anybody else brave enough to speak up at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday? Uh, I'd say Pythagorean theorem. What is that, Charles? I never heard of it. <laughs> no, very good. That is getting in a little bit more of the trig side. Uh, obviously, you guys should have seen that in geometry. So I'm going to hold off on that one. But very good, Charles. That is another thing that we will utilize in this class quite frequently. So I'm going to give you what, in my opinion, are the big three. Okay. 
And again, this is just what I believe can help us not only in this class, but in the future classes. And the first one is called? The identity property. Now you guys probably have heard of identity theft and things like that before. Uh, what does it mean, do you think, in math as a property when they're talking about your identity? Who are they talking about? What are they talking about by identity? I like that answer. Somebody said units in the chat there. Good idea. If we're talking about identity, we're talking about each individual, right? Every single one of you there. And to Anissa's point earlier about multiplication, well, guess what? If you want to get back something identical, what is the one thing? Let me say that again. What is the one thing that you can multiply by to keep the same thing there? as far as the units or value of it, but change the look of it maybe. For example, Cimarron, do me a quick favor. Take off your glasses. Do you guys still see Cimarron there? It's still her, but she looks a little different, right? But it's still her identity. It's still Cimarron. Go ahead and put him back on. That way you can see me. Very good. Thanks for playing along. What do you think we could do always to, let's call it anything. What do you think we can multiply by to get back something identical, the same thing, even though it may look a little bit different, for example, with the glasses on or off? Very good. Quite a few of you just put it in the chat. You know that you can take A, anything, and multiply it by a fancy one, and you will get back the same thing. Now, I'm going to show you throughout today that that one and throughout this course, that one is going to look very, very different time to time to time to time. And believe it or not, you guys have been doing and using this since elementary school. Okay, that identity property. Which I'll just refer to it as multiplication by one. Okay, excellent. Very good. What's another thing that we use and see a lot? What the social world is all about right now, right? Equality. Math has known it all along, okay? Equality, meaning that we have this symbol, and that symbol is obviously, that is what they made up. An 11 on its side, right? That equality property, which we are going to use in equations. And in order to solve equations, you guys know, whatever we do to one side of that equation to keep it equal, we got to do the same thing to the other side. Equality. Okay. Again, been doing that for a very, very long time. Not as long, but we had to introduce variables and things like that. Or... In elementary school, they just left them as blanks before we called them X or letters. The third one is one that you probably wouldn't have guessed. You may not even know this term. Officially in its capacity. But it's called the inverse. 
in the fancy math term that we use, inverse just means what in simple terms? The opposite. Ooh, very good, Elijah. That's what most people say. But unfortunately, that's incorrect. Because if I ask you for the opposite of five, what are you going to tell me? You're going to say negative five. Somebody said flipped. So if I took five and flipped it, I'd have one over five. That's actually called the reciprocal. And those are two things that get thrown into this a lot. And these three terms, the inverse, the reciprocal, and the opposite, people just screw those up all the time and use them interchangeably. Okay? You can obviously see that this is way different than this. A negative five versus a one-fifth, way different. So when we say opposite, the symbol we use for that is that negative. And when we say reciprocal, what we do is take our fraction, whether it is one or not, and we flip it. But the inverse, what we mean by it is simply just reverse. To undo what was done to something, whether it be a variable or whatever. Right? And that's something that you guys also have learned since the very, very beginning. When you first learn numbers, digits. You then learn how to add them. And when you got good at that, then what did you learn how to do next? Subtract them. How to undo adding. And then when you got really good at that, then you learn how to add the same number a bunch of times. You called it timesing or multiplication. And then when you got good at that, you learn how to undo that. And what's the inverse of multiplying? Dividing, and so on and so forth. You guys get my idea. Squaring square roots, right? So this, this, and this are three of the most important concepts in all of math that we use over and over and over, and we will continue to do so in this class, okay? You will see and hear me say this all the time. We will be solving equations. It's a math class after all. And in order to do that, we'll be undoing or using the inverse to isolate and solve our equation for some variable. Okay? So I was hoping that I'd get a lot more things, but maybe now you guys are a little bit more comfortable that I've thrown out the three and it's not so much pressure. Are there any others that you guys think you might see in the future that you remember? There's another big one. That would probably be number four for me. Knowing how to factor. Oh, what about uh, distributing? Good. I'm going to leave that with this one, order of operations. Oh, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. But yeah, that's, that's very close, Charles. I mean, that's, again, you're right there. Distributing, definitely. I'm going to combine some of the two that you said and put simplifying. Because distributing, you would simplify. And uh, what was the other one that you said? I remember. Oh, earlier, like the Pythagorean theorem I said? Or? Pythagorean theorem, right. Using that to simplify things. Awesome. Somebody put in the chat rounding. Definitely something that we will do. That's a, a way of simplifying. Very good. There's this other thing called the zero factor property. 
and that's kind of combining factoring and solving an equation, right? That's when we have factors set equal to zero. And we know the only way that this multiplied together will equal zero is if either this thing comes out zero and this thing comes out zero. That's how we solve equations using factoring. There's a bunch of them. Graphing, even though I know you guys aren't particularly excited about that most of the time. Showing ourselves where all the answers or solutions are when there's more than just one. That's why we graph. Okay. Word problems, which are just applications of how we can use this in the real world. Again, not one that a lot of students like because. We just don't have it out in front of us. We have to actually take all of those words and try to make it into something, an equation, hopefully one equation with one unknown. Let me make sure I put that up here. Because that's all we really know how to solve. If there's two equations and we need for two variables, right? We'd need two equations. And then we get it down to one equation, one unknown, and solve for that one variable, right? So again, we could go on with this. Uh, one of the key things I wanna make sure that you guys also put on there is just being able to analyze and reason through a problem. That's gonna help you in this math class, especially, okay? Because trig isn't all algebra where you just see an equation, you do an equation. You're gonna actually have to think things through as well, right? And then the last thing I'm gonna add on here is just making mistakes. but I wanna make sure that you learn from there, okay? That's what you wanna make sure that you're okay with, knowing that you are gonna make mistakes and it's okay, as long as it's not on the test, all right? So that's why we have all these other things in place, um, meeting today, going over these notes, practicing in examples, doing these little group quizzes, then doing it on homework, so by the time you actually get to an exam, you should have it down pat, no issues, All right? So that's it as far as the notes go. All I'm gonna do now is a few examples of these different types of things that hopefully you remember and we'll see moving forward, okay? So let's start with a few simple ones here using a little thing called dimensional analysis. Okay, and the way that we're gonna do that is, hopefully you guys see it in the description here, multiplying by one to manipulate our statements. So you guys should already be able to look at this and tell me. If I have four dimes, I have how many nickels? Somebody put eight. How? I'm not okay with you guys just giving me answers because you could have looked that up. It doesn't show me that you understand what you're doing, right? So you gotta be able to show me what you have and what I want. And remember what we said is what we currently have is an equation a statement 
of equality, that the left side has to be equal to the right side. So four dimes is what I have. And I know that the only thing I can do to this is multiply it by a fancy one to keep what I have, but hopefully make different. And so I made it a fraction because I want to get rid of the dimes. So I'm going to divide so that I know anything divided by itself becomes a one and it cancels out, we call it. But I want to have nickels on top. And as long as I know a relationship between nickels and dimes, then I can do this. I can multiply by one. Now, obviously, we've done in the past where a one is like a three over three or root two over root two. Those are obvious ones. But this, what I'm going to call a fancy one, what is the relationship that you guys know between nickels and dimes? Dimes you need two good. nickels, too. Go ahead. No, sir. I was saying that's a dimes have double the value of nickels. Good. So we know that two nickels is equivalent. There's that word again to one dime. Very good. So does everybody agree that this is a fancy one? I could just cancel these and say it's a one because I know that this is worth 10 cents and I know this is worth 10 cents. So it's like we're multiplying by this, which is just that fancy one that we talked about earlier. Does that make sense? So this is called dimensional analysis. Okay, we're going to change the unit measurement by multiplying by a fancy one. And since we have multiplication going on, I know that anything divided by itself is just a one. And now we know we multiply straight across and I get four times one times two, which is eight nickels on top and a bunch of ones on bottom, which means I don't need it. Okay, so I started this off with something very, very simple and easy. Now, without you guys looking it up, this is way easier when we're in class because I know that most of you won't have the av availability so easily to look it up. Who can tell me how many feet are in one mile? Without looking it up, does anybody know that? Somebody put 60 in the chat. Isn't that sad? This is our system, right? I could teach you guys the whole metric system, which is what the rest of the world uses in probably one of these two hour sessions. Now you wouldn't have a good feel of what is what as far as meters and kilometers and centimeters and all that stuff. But I could teach you how to manipulate and use things so very simply because it is very simple. It's all base 10. All you do is move decimals to the left or to the right. It's awesome. But we seceded from England some time ago, but not entirely. Our system still has old, very old and outdated measurements. Where you guys should know how many feet are in a yard. How many feet are in a yard? <clears throat> 12. Three. See the problem? Our system stinks. It's very, very bad. Somebody said 12. Well, that's actually inches to feet. Somebody also said three feet is one yard. Why all these random numbers? Well, they actually are from kings and a king's thumb. 
one of his feet measured up to 12 of his thumbs. And that's why we call 12 inches in one foot. Really? That's what we're using in 2022? Still? Well, and then another king came along. He said, okay, well, I'm going to up your thumb, your 12 thumbs to your one foot. I'm going to take that measurement of a foot and I'm going to go from the tip of my chin out to my outstretched arm. And that distance measured up to guess how many feet? Three feet yard. Guys, if you don't even know this, the smaller measurements of distance, there's no way that you know how many feet are in a mile. Anybody look it up yet? Go ahead, ask Siri, whoever you want. Yeah, Samara. <laughs> 5,000, that was a terrible five. 5,280 feet. But again, I'm not okay with you guys just writing answers down. So how are we going to manipulate this? Can we only multiply by one once? Or can we do it multiple times? What is that still equal to? A. Very good. So it does not matter how many times we multiply by one. So... You may have never seen this before. I'm going to prove to you why it's 5,280, but you may have to have a little bit of a track background to know this. Anybody ever run? You're like just from people and not, not for fun. Well, one mile is what we have, and we need to multiply by something to get rid of the miles which means I'm going to put it on bottom. And I need to know some relationship between how many times you run around a track. For example, does anybody know? Do you remember that from PE? How many four miles? Times, right? Say you it again. Four times, four times around the track. Very good. So I'm going to go ahead and use that. Very good, Sam. Four laps was equivalent to one mile. Good. Now, that means we got rid of miles, but we wanted to convert it to feet, not laps, which is what we have right now. So we're going to have to multiply by another fancy one. And this time, we want to get rid of laps. Does anybody know what one lap is equivalent to? In something that we know. Now, remember, keep in mind, we want it to be feet. Now, if you watch the Olympics, you probably know one lap is 400 what? Meters. Yeah, very good, Luis. Excellent. The 400 meter is one lap around. But unfortunately, we're the one of two. There's only one other very small country called Burma that uses this system. Everyone else in the world uses meters, the metric system. So let's see if anybody knows how many yards one lap is. I'll be really impressed if you do. Now, you could always just ask Siri or look up what is 400 meters in yards, right? Is it 440? How'd you know that, Samra? I got the um, 5,280, and then I divided by that by four. And then <laughs> I got, I think it was 1350, and then I divided that by three. Nice, nice. So we're just going the other direction. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean here in a second. Very good. Excellent. I like that. 
So, good news. We got rid of the laps, but now we're in yards. But that's okay because we know what yards and feet are equivalent. And remember at the very beginning, I told you to keep things equal, we can do whatever we want to one side as long as we do it to the other. So if I want to divide this side by one yard, I can divide this side by one yard. And I know anything divided by itself is just a big one. So I know that three feet divided by one yard is equivalent to one. So if I wanted to do one last multiplication by one, the fancy one I'm going to use this time is I'm going to get rid of the yards and I want to convert it to feet. And we should know that one yard is equivalent to three feet. And so the yards cancel out to become ones. In everything but the ones, notice all the denominators, all ones. So we can just forget about that because we know anything divided by one is just itself. Just like multiplying by one. And if we concentrate on the top, notice what are the only units that are left? That's what we wanted. So all we would have to do is multiply in any order. I'll just do three times four, which go ahead and do that in your calculator or in your head, hopefully. There's our math facts Anissa mentioned earlier. 12 times 440. And guess what you get? 5,280. I just proved to you guys why 5,280 feet is equivalent to one mile. By multiplying by a fancy one three different times to what we initially had. Okay, so this can be used in all different facets. We're gonna be using it quite frequently in this class. Okay, but trig related stuff. So don't freak out that you don't know how many inches are in a foot or how many feet are in a yard, all right? We'll change gears and learn new things in here. So one last thing pertaining to yards and feet. And inches, I want you to take that and subtract that from it. So before I let you guys try this on your own, I want to make sure that you set this up correctly. Which one should we put on top and which one should we put on bottom to subtract? Uh, the five yards one on top and then three yards on the bottom. Good, because we're going to subtract this one from that one. Okay, do me a favor. Go ahead and try this on your own. I'll give you two minutes. All right, let's see how you did. What'd you start with? I started with seven minus the 10, but there wasn't enough. So I borrowed from the one foot and then since I took one from that, I left it at 11 inches and then carried the one over to the seven. Okay. Now remember, all you have here is one foot. So you're oh. not just borrowing an inch, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to say I have zero feet left when you borrow, but that doesn't mean you just put a one here. You'd add the 12 then? Yeah, very good. Because we're going from feet to inches, we're actually adding... 12 there, which means we're going to have a total of 19. 19 inches, and that will allow us to subtract 10 from it now and give us, that's not the hard part, right? The hard yeah. part is borrowing things that aren't just our normal groups of 10, groups of 10, groups of 10, base 10 model that we've learned since the very beginning. 
Okay, very good. Excellent start, Samara. <coughs> Am I saying your name correctly? Uh, Samara. Samara, I apologize. Thank You're you for good. correcting me. Now, we need to go to the next column. And that next column has zero feet, and we're trying to subtract two feet. Obviously, we can't subtract two feet when we don't have any feet. So we got to go here and borrow again. But remember, when you borrow from here, obviously, we're going to have one less. But that doesn't mean we all of a sudden have 10 feet. Because what are we borrowing? A yard, so three feet. And we're gaining feet. So very good. When I borrow, I'm going to have one less, but I'm going to add three feet to it. So now I have three feet, and I'm going to subtract two feet to get one foot left. And if you got that far, obviously the four minus three, these are like terms already. We can subtract and get one yard. Anybody get that? Uh, yeah, I got four feet and nine inches. Good, I like that. That'll work. He combined some other things together, maybe just rewrote more of it rather than keeping them compartmentalized. Awesome, good. Again, we're not going to do this exact type of thing, but there will be something similar to it. We're going to call them degrees, minutes, and seconds. Talking about more and more concise, smaller versions, but in trigonometry, we're talking about measurements of angles. Okay. A couple more things. We'll jam through these a little bit more quickly. There's that word inverse. And what's the fancy math term inverse mean in plain terms? Reverse. Okay. So a few ways that we do that. One of you guys mentioned distributing. What is distributing? How could you explain that to somebody that doesn't know? Spreading things out. I like that. But that doesn't tell me what to do necessarily. Right, Anissa? What does it mean to distribute? It means to take one thing and multiply it to many. And so you should know what 6x times 5x is. 30x squared. And then 6x times a negative 3. Positive times a negative is negative. We get 18x. And that's it. It's a way to simplify by multiplying one thing to more than one thing. But when I don't just have one thing outside of a parentheses, that tells me to distribute or multiply it to a bunch. What if I have more than one thing outside of a parentheses? Well, if the X was the only thing there and that two wasn't, then you know that you would distribute the X. And vice versa, if the X wasn't there and it was just a two, then you would distribute the two. Now, a lot of people call this foiling. I don't like foil. Okay, because you can't warm up your leftovers if you wrapped it in it, right? If you bite down on it, it kind of hurts sometimes. No, I'm kidding. That's not why I don't like foil. I don't like foiling because it only works, that foil, for the first outer, inner, and last when you have a binomial times a binomial. If I had x squared plus 2x minus 5 times x minus 8, now there's no such thing as FOIL. And the way I like to teach is I like to use stuff that works always, not just for certain circumstances. So guess what I'm going to call this? 
Same thing I call that because that's exactly what we're going to do. But instead of only having to do it once, we're going to have to distribute the X and the two. We're going to have to do it twice. Okay. So let's distribute twice. First, the X, which gives me an X squared when I do X times X and then a negative eight X. And then I'm going to distribute and FOIL the two to both of those things and get a positive 2x and a negative 16. Be careful with your signs. And then of course, as you guys mentioned earlier today, we want to simplify things. And the only things that we can add or subtract are things that are alike. Because you know adding means you're gonna have more of something. Subtracting, you're gonna have less of something. But what can't change is that thing. So I'm still gonna have an x squared. I'm still going to have negative 16 ones, but how many X's do I have? That would be negative six. And now there's nothing else that's alike. Okay. So that is distributing or repetitive multiplication. Let's do the inverse of that. What does the inverse mean again? Reverse. Very good. Excellent. All of you that put it in the chat and Samara that said it out loud. How are we going to do the reverse of distributing? Well, is it really called undistributing? Have you ever heard of that before? That doesn't sound very mathy or technical, right? So what is it known as? Factoring. Very good. Very good. You may have never thought of that before. Because what did we say our distributing meant that we did? We multiply it. And what do we say the inverse of multiplying is? Division. Then we're trying to do the reverse by dividing these things. These polynomials are called. So is there something that we can divide and we want it to be the greatest thing that they have in common that we can factor or divide out? See what I did there? The greatest thing that they have in common that we could factor or divide out. It's called the GCF. And what do 30 and 18 each have in common that we can divide in nicely? Six. Then to undo the dividing by six, we got to multiply by six. But what about the variables? The X's as well. Can't forget about our X's, right? Even though we want to, you know what I'm saying? No, just me. All right. Well, this has, thank you. This has two, that has one. So the most I can factor divide out is the least amount that I have. I can't factor out more than one X because this doesn't have more than one, All right? And that's what I tell my wife and I'm sticking to it. All right, so with this, I'm going to be able to factor out, we say, to undo the dividing by that 6x to make it look simpler. We're going to multiply by 6x on the outside. Now let's do the dividing. How many times does 6x go into 30x squared? Five. And? Five. Good. Minus 6 goes into that. 3 and x into that, that's a 1. So we get this. And does anybody recognize that? Look back in your notes if you're taking them, which I hope it was you are. the equation we distributed. Yeah, look at example 4. I'm trying to prove to you guys that these are inverses of each other, distributing and factoring. 
So you can probably guess what this is. But I want to make sure that you guys remember how to do that. Anytime we have a what is called a trinomial, one, two, three terms, we set up our binomial times binomial, and we think about distributing backwards. That's what factoring is. And I know what would have to go here and here to get me that first thing. X times X would give me X squared. Then I'm going to jump to the other end. And I'm going to think about, well, not only do I need a 16, I need it to be negative. And the only way that I can multiply two things to be a negative is if one is positive and one is negative. But there's a several different things that I can multiply to get a 16. A one and 16, a two and an eight, a four and a four. So not only do I know all of these, if I put in here and here would work to get the negative 16, that means to figure out what does go here, which one pair of these, I have to look to the middle and see which of these pairs would, since they are different signs, give me a difference of negative six. And obviously that is going to be which pair. But does it matter where I put the two and where I put the eight? Yeah, the eight should be with the minus. Good. I got to put the bigger number with the sign that I want. So the eight would have to go here and the two there. And again, how do you know if this is the correct factoring? Foil it. Distribute it. I already know that's going to give me that. I already know that's going to give me that. The only thing you really need to check is did I get the middle right? And that would give me a negative 8x. That would give me a positive 2x to get my negative 6x that I wanted. Okay? So factoring is pretty nice because look at all the work I had to show. Not much. Right? Definitely want to make sure that you guys know how to do that. And then, of course, let's make sure that we know how to, at the very end here, use that zero product property in order to solve these equations. Now, some of them will just have what is called a linear equation, power of one. Some will have both the power of one and a two. So how do I solve this one? What would I do first? I got to use the inverse. I got to undo everything that is currently being done to that variable that I want to know. And how am I going to do that? Where would I start? Would you start by subtracting the three from both sides? Very good. Anissa had mentioned earlier PIMDAS, order of operations. If I was to plug in something for X, I told you, let it be three, right? Then you would take that and multiply it by two, then add three to see if it's equal to 11. Well, we're gonna work in reverse order. Reverse order. We're gonna first, like Samara said, subtract three to both sides. And again, to keep it equal, we gotta do it equally. And I know three minus three cancels out. So now I got two X equals what's 11 minus three gang. Eight. Good. Now what's being done to my X. You're dividing it by two. Good. It's being multiplied by two. So the inverse to undo that I would divide. And as long as I do it to both sides equally, I now know two over two is one. And now I got my one X is equal to four. And notice there was only one X. I only got one answer. That is the one and only thing that would make this a true statement in equation. But over here, it's now set equal to zero. Am I gonna be able to isolate the X? Well, no, there isn't just a single X. So we're gonna start by doing what we said earlier. And we're gonna go ahead and 
try to factor. And what goes into both 30x squared and that negative 18x? Does this look familiar? No, six. A six and an x. Now remember, I could divide everything by 6x because this is an equation. But you never want to divide by something you don't know what it is. Okay? Never divide by a variable, even though it's an equation. So the way that we do it to just one side is by a little thing called factoring. To undo that dividing, we multiply by that 6x. Now I can do the division here and here, and we already did this. We said it was 5x minus 3. Is there anything else I can do to this equation right now? Good. So since there's nothing else that we could do, I put parentheses around this because I do know that these are multiplying together. <clears throat> and if they're multiplying together, when is something times something only ever going to equal zero? Zero. That's if one of those or both of them are a zero. So a lot of people won't know what to do with this one on the outside because they won't put the parentheses. So I always like to put them just to show you. Look, this is just something times something equals zero still. So what we are going to do next is set each of those things equal to zero. So I'll take 6x and 5x minus 3 and solve those. And careful. This is where a lot of people make a mistake. They won't do this step and they'll say our answers and they'll give them incorrectly. This one you should be able to do because you know that you're just going to add the three over and then you're going to divide by five. So you're going to add the three over, divide by five, you get three fifths. But what are you going to do for this? Is it a negative six? No, that's a common mistake that a lot of people will put. Okay, you got to undo the multiplying by six and divide by six to get a zero. Add the three, if you didn't see it when I said it, divide by five. And you get two answers, notice, because we had a power of two in our equation. All right. Again, the last one, hopefully you recognize this is the same thing we had earlier. Just wanted to show you. X minus eight, X plus two. When I set those equal to zero, give me an answer of eight and negative two. And those are the two and only two answers that would make that thing true. Okay. So Wanted to start us off nice and slow, nice and easy. I hope some of you were kind of bored with that because this is all stuff that you should know, but I wanted to really go slow, make sure that you guys knew how to do a lot of these things that should be what are called prerequisite concepts. All right. 